It's providing us every day with new discoveries like DNA gene sequencing, natural resource discoveries, scientific modeling, and telemetry. These all take significant talents and skills across the spectrum to bring to fruition. And open source software solutions are at the core of so many of these advances. In 2018, a survey of 150 cloud service providers found that open source Linux is expected to be a critical piece of next generation networking solutions. And communication service providers have expressed overwhelming confidence in open source networking solutions. As these solutions evolve and mature over time, we can see challenges being addressed and conquered one by one. Linux works. 5G requires a massive expansion of infrastructure to realize its full potential. There is no shortage of challenges in the evolution of an ecosystem as complex as 5G. Infrastructure in open source encompasses not only the physical hardware, but the people and the community required to evolve and to navigate these rapidly changing requirements. As with building a house, when you build something to last, you must lay a strong foundation. In 5G, this foundation is the most important element of them all. Many disciplines must be harnessed and all aligned to the end goal or fractures will inevitably occur and lead to a very different product far from the aims of the original goal. This is where we are investing. We've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in open source forums like OMAC, all to advance the cause of 5G. Intel believes we must invest not only in the underlying technology, but also in the people that will innovate and drive that next wave of technology. This investment is not optional. It is critical to the success of 5G. Some of these challenges can only be met by a diverse community that develops requirements from both ends and brings them effectively together to deliver a solution that works for all the stakeholders. The smallest snowflake can propagate the biggest avalanche of innovation. This concept, of course, works in both directions. We benefit greatly by having customers as part of the solution space and customers benefit by having direct and unfettered access to the developers. Today's customers, whether cloud, enterprise, or communication service providers, demand reliability, flexibility, innovation, and performance. Linux, of course, fits this mold perfectly. High performance, low cost, cutting edge solutions that are evolving and maturing quickly and integrating into these 5G ecosystems. Tens of thousands of contributors and engineers working every day just to maintain and develop these required capabilities. As the complexity of these integrated networks increase and the pace of innovation quickens, we may as well be launching a man to the moon over and over again. There are a few more apt comparisons to what we are trying to achieve in 5G today than what NASA accomplished in sending a man to the moon. NASA estimates that it had required more than 400,000 engineers, scientists, and technicians to accomplish the moon landings. That was a gargantuan task maybe almost as big as bringing a vision of 5G as intended to market. It has been estimated that approximately 100,000 people work and contribute to the Linux user space in kernel development in various ways. So I would suggest that what we are doing here today requires perhaps even a bigger collaboration across more disciplines than NASA achieved in landing a man on the moon or in a TV studio, whichever you believe. To that point, we believe we need to create the ecosystem of industry leaders, educators, innovators, planners, managers, dreamers, and outside the box thinkers that we will require to get this job done. No one is more committed to doing this than Intel. Thank you. Sean, thank you for that fantastic kickoff. And we do hope and we do hope that the community contributes to make OMEC and the code base that we'll, bringing in, we'll be bringing into OMEC as robust and as widely adopted as Linux. Thank you, Sean. So I'm not on that 
fantastic kick off can you take over please sure thanks ashok uh, thanks uh, shan okay so let me start sharing my screen okay so it says a uh, host disabled attendee screen sharing dennis can you see if you can enable the screen sharing for me please okay perfect thank you all right so uh, can you see my screen yes sure. perfect thank you all right so this is uh, uh, i'm going just going to continue from where i left off on monday uh, but uh, for people who couldn't join on monday i'll just give a, a brief intro here uh, basically from intel side uh, uh, three engineers work uh, on this project ashok sundarajan is a principal engineer who started this project started the whole in engagement um, i am somnath chakravarty i am uh, a security researcher at intel labs and uh, suresh marikannu who is a software engineer from hcl uh, on monday we discussed the design changes uh, the high level requirements and some of the critical issues uh, that we had to deal with during the development of this uh, project and we discussed uh, uh, the cdr flow and uh, the core uh, assignment the way it was done before and the way it uh, is done for the teamable code base and why it was done all the issues related to that today we will start with the cdrs uh, uh, specifically the secure cdrs and uh, with that let me switch to the presentation here all right so just a minute let me go full screen okay there all right so now we are going to talk about the right hand side uh, and I've specifically marked it in the red circle there uh, so you can see the green boxes they are basically components uh, dealing with the security uh, of the cdrs the cdrs are getting generated from the control plane uh, as against uh, cdrs that's generated from the data plane in the original omec code base in the t-mobile code base they are being generated from the control plane and once the cdrs are generated the control plane pushes those cdrs into something called uh, sgx cdr dealer in so the even the communication between the control plane and the dealer in it's a tls uh, authenticated tls connection uh, where uh, the control plane verifies uh, not just the the tls connection parameters but also verifies the intel sgx parameters and which I'll, I'll talk about this gx a bit later and uh, those uh, records are then pushed uh, uh, conveyed into a asn format uh, which can be consumed by the billing system and they are pushed and stored into a repository here uh, again note note that this repository is could be a storage device it could be a queue uh, uh, anything that uh, need not be trusted because the contents are already secured encrypted and protected so the medium doesn't matter on the other side the, when the billing system uh, triggers the connection and wants to read these uh, cdrs the billing system does a similar uh, round of handshakes with the dealer out uh, in the sense it does the authentication of a tls but the protocol here is ftp so it supports standard ftp protocol using which it can uh, 
transfer all those records out uh, using the dealer uh, out uh, subsystem. So the question is then uh, why SGX, right? I mean, why can't we just uh, do it in a way where uh, we can just encrypt it somewhere and keep it uh, on the on the disk and uh, then while reading, we could just decrypt and read it. And the reason is the any encryption method that you will follow, uh, what will happen is the encryption keys will somehow or somewhere needs to be stored in clear. So that's the whole point of uh, 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 storing it and using encryption, right? You encrypt something, but the keys that you use to encrypt or decrypt, the keys needs to be in clear somewhere. So SGX uh, solves the problem in a different way. What SGX does here is, SGX basically think of it as a fine-grained uh, uh, trusted execution environment in your application space. And that environment is completely under your control in terms of what that environment will do. But once that environment starts executing, even the application that is hosting that environment doesn't have any control or any visibility inside that environment anymore. So now that environment, uh, we call it the enclave, that environment can now generate the keys inside itself, distribute the keys based on certain trust parameters to only another environment that is also SGX. And then these keys could be used to encrypt or decrypt any traffic or any packet or any data it wants. But the, those keys will never come out of that environment. So that means even the application, the operating system, the VMM, uh, even uh, some uh, most of the hardware components that you see on the platform, they have no visibility, they have no control over what happens or what data is being used inside that environment. That's basically SGX. So with that thought, what we have done is we have basically used the SGX components uh, like dealer in, uh, Again, those are like, the SGX is a technology. We, we develop those components using this technology. So uh, for the dealer uh, SGX billing system, the dealer system, the key management system, those are all built using the SGX technology. And they are running in a way where the trust factor for that CDR system is bounded by the SGX uh, enclaves and the keys or the attestation parameters, they never leave outside the SGX boundary. So with that, what did we what what do we get? We get a fully fully secured, scalable, and auditable SGX based integrated billing system. Uh, the audit part, I will have a separate slide on that. I'll talk about that. And uh, in this slide, in, in the first slides, here I have shown only one control plane being connected to the dealer in system, but uh, practically you can connect uh, up to seven control planes to the system and all could be streaming at the same time. So uh, that's the performance. We, we actually in lab some, uh, on some systems, we did test up to 11 streams, but uh, what we saw is with seven gives a very stable uh, number. With 11, we observe some jitters. So that's why we published the, the seven is to one ratio for the control plane and the CDRs. On the other side, uh, on the consumption side, uh, the, it's all ASN uh, one formatted records and it, it talks just uh, regular FTP over SSL. However, the client, uh, which is the billing system, they also needs to make sure it can provide the right certificate for the dealer out to to authenticate the connection. All right, uh, so now let's look at a little bit more in detail what's going on here, right? So here, uh, again, on the extreme left, we have the control plane uh, with uh, some certificates from the operator, uh, some certificates from the, uh, from the Intel IS, uh, the Intel attestation service. Again, remember some, some of these are optional uh, but just for the sake of completeness, I've put everything here. Uh, now, the, the control plane connects to the dealer in, 
uh, and the dealer in authenticates the control plane connection, control plane authenticates the dealer in connection. Uh, the same thing happens on the extreme right side where the billing system connects to the dealer out. Now, if you look at this, both the dealer in the dealer out subsystem, they talk to something uh, called the key gen. And the, the key gen uh, enclave is the enclave that generates the encryption keys and uh, keeps it with itself. And it will only distribute to the dealer in and dealer out if, uh, the, if, the, if the key generator can trust the dealer in and dealer out. Similarly, the dealer in dealer out will only accept the keys from a key gen if it can trust. So both of them, they have their measurements, their signer keys. Uh, so they can, what they do is essentially uh, in practice, they, uh, once the, uh, during the SSL or the TLS handshake that happens between them, they also exchange the SDX parameters. So there's a mutual attestation happening between both components uh, before the keys are actually distributed. But once the keys are distributed, the, and the keys are only distributed after the trust is established, but once the keys are distrib distributed, the keys always remain inside that SGX boundary. It never leaves the SGX boundary. So technically, even the operator doesn't have or doesn't, uh, doesn't have the knowledge of the keys. So even if they want to tamper with the records, there is practically no way uh, for them to go and um, look into the records or change the records in any way. So that's a little bit of crypto what's happening here. I'll not go into more details, but just going to just give you an overview of how this SGX uh, system works. All right, so uh, again, uh, so how can you verify, right? Question is how can you verify that the records have not been tampered with? Uh, how can an auditor uh, verify that? How can the operator themselves verify that? It's very simple, there's few al algorithmic steps that one has to follow and uh, basically talk to the KMS, uh, get some measurements uh, from the KMS system, uh, talk to the uh, uh, dealer out here, uh, uh, get some measurements, use those measurements to read the records from the CDR repository, make sure it, you can, uh, uh, it, it matches up with the, the measurement that you took, and then uh, invoke a tool, a tool could be, we could, we could also publish the tool, the tool, tool could be written by the auditors themselves, and uh, if the, 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 if the parameters match, then you know that uh, nothing has been tampered with and everything looks good. If uh, parameters don't match, then you can safely say, no, uh, I mean, with, the auditors can call out saying, no, something is wrong. And the, the records uh, don't match up anymore. At least the, param the metadata of the records don't match up anymore. So we can't trust the records anymore. All right, so, okay, so with that, uh, I'll quickly go over uh, what kind of uh, uh, tests and performance uh, numbers, uh, basically what tests uh, we ran. Sorry, Somnath, maybe I, yes, I should on. comment uh, about this SGX technology. Sure. Uh, this technology uh, is very helpful uh, in terms of the lawful interceptions that we are planning to do. Because in case of the lawful interception, there is a requi strict requirement that all the information in the memory should not be accessible by anyone, even for the OS or the hypervisor. Yes, so th with this technology, we can assure that the control plane uh, have this ally information stored in the secure part of the memory and it will be accessible only by you know our application yeah perfect thanks a lot uh, rafael mm -hmm. and there are two, two questions uh, what protocol is used to send cdr to sgx cdr dealer in i believe well, that this is that, proprietary, that's binary. right Correct. Yeah. that's pure that's a pure binary uh, uh, transfer. There is no uh, specific uh, format. Uh, I mean, there's no <coughs> published format. It, it's, it's up to, actually it's up to you how you want to send it. Uh, the reason we didn't have to implement, uh, let me go back here. The reason we uh, didn't uh, implement any specific protocol here because uh, no other component is uh, involved in 
uh, consuming, consuming the record at this stage. So it's only the gateway, uh, the control plane, and the dealer in. So any, any protocol could be used here. And there is a second question. Is this push model or pull model of the, on the right? And it is a pull uh, model. It's a, yeah. it's, a, it's a pull model on the right. That's right. Right. Yep. OK. All right. So uh, on the performance, uh, I'll just quickly go over it. It's nothing special. We uh, did discuss this kind of performance numbers uh, during the OMEC workshop as well last year. So basically we have two tools to test it. One is the traffic gen, which doesn't do any control signaling, just pumps data on the data path. Uh, we tested it with 10,000 users, uh, 80 node Bs, and uh, we tested it up to 2 million packets per second on each direction, that is uplink and downlink. And th these are the numbers we, we observed. Now, interestingly, you can see we tested with two different configurations on the CPU. One is the AVX instructions, the advanced vector instruction on the CPU, and one is without the advanced vector instruction on the CPU. Vector instructions basically give you some advantage when you are doing uh, like a, some, some, app, some, some operation or some function over an array or, or, or operation on a sequence of numbers, it can do it in, in much less number of uh, CPU cycles. But more importantly, we did see significant boost with AVX instructions, especially in handling uh, mixed burst packets. Right, Somna? That's right. That's absolutely right. Because, uh, because the mixed burst packets, uh, you could, uh, what, traditionally what you do is you go packet by packet based on the mask, and then you uh, segregate them and filter them out. AVX can give you an advantage where you can do it in bulk. I think more than the technology, we need to sensitize what does mis mixed burst packets mean. Uh, that's something we realized with the mobile Poland uh, in an operational network. Uh, in our own, is that okay, so that's so. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. So, so basically, uh, the underlying transport driver, which is TPDK, is tuned for single, single type of traffic flow. You have either GTP flows or you have some IP flows. Uh, in mixed mode, what happens is you have a mix of Linux management packets, such as Arc Discovery, Route Discovery packets, mixed with the fast path packets, which are GTP packets. What then happens is if you take a packet burst of 32 packets, uh, and if your route discovery management flows are pretty intense, so generally in the lab, the way we test is we test for fast path packets. But when the mix in an operational network, that's what we realized with KMO. In an operational network, uh, the packets aren't as, the fast path packets aren't as fast as we, we try to test them to be. So a burst of 32 packets would generally have a 10, 10% uh, 10 or 20%. So it, one or two packets in every burst of 32 packets would be a Linux packet. What then happens is, if you're handling, if DPDK technologies handle the burst of packets and you don't have AVX, you take a performance hit because now you're going packet by packet. You have a for loop which takes it packet by packet and then says, this is a fast path packet, that's a slow path packet. Uh, you basically implement a flow redirector in software. AVX eliminates just that. We did do some performance measurements uh, and AVX uh, essentially you get a performance off the top of my head. This is 15 or 20% performance boost when you have mixed packets and AVX kicks in. Perfect. Thanks Ashok. So yeah, for the other uh, test vector is with Spirant uh, where the Spirant also does the control signaling, uh, but we only did uh, up to 1 million packets per second test with Spiral. We can keep the other parameters same. So yeah, so uh, definitely, I mean, if you are, any of you guys are interested in understanding more about these tests, uh, feel free to contact us. We can discuss more. So with that, uh, we uh, we go to uh, the demo. It will be Suresh, yeah. 
So yes, Suresh. but before that, before that, uh, Ashok, I really want your thoughts uh, on on the design philosophy or the overall development strategy that we took for T Mobile Poland. That would be very, very. That will help a lot. Thank you. So that I can talk a lot. My request is position me so I know what the hell I'm supposed to speak. So I so good no good point. So just wanted your thoughts here on the the whole engagement that we started with T-Mobile Poland. You actually started that engagement, and uh, the journey we we all uh, went through this uh, for the last uh, nine or ten months, more more than a year now. And then all the challenges, the the the, the your experience basically. I just want to make sure that we all hear you. Uh, on the on the on the whole project. No, no, thank you. That gives me some frame. I'll be. So first is I didn't start the engagement uh, to the participants on the call. T-Mobile Poland, specifically Mihal Severa, and Rafal Arshishevsky. I hope I got that pronunciation right. Started the engagement, and where they started was January 2019 about a year, a little more than a year back, they downloaded code that Somnath, myself, Suresh had upstreamed, which primarily exists as the main branch today at OMAC. So Rafal and Darius, Darius downloaded the code and Jan 2019, they basically told us, me, Somnath, this is a piece of crap. And it will not work. I didn't say that. No. Okay, fine, Rafal. You said something better, but I'm saying the way I took it. Okay. And that's basically what's got what got us started. The statement was okay. Rafal said it better, but the point is, he got me hooked. Uh, the focus up until 2019 January for us as Intel researchers were, let's get code base that is performant and that is about conformant so it works so we had test generators spirants and stuff but let's make sure that you can scale so we are not looking at one off two off flows we are looking at millions of flows millions of packets per second and our focus was where do things break when we push the pedal to the metal what t mobile brought to scope was Yes, maybe it's performant, but it needs to be conformant. This code needs to work in an operational network, in a production environment. And for us, Intel specifically, I, I felt it was a huge learning that we had missed. And thanks to Rafael uh, Darius, who's not on the call, Mihal Severa, we learned. These guys taught us how telco networks work. At that point, there was no stopping. I realized that every piece, so you guys, if you go and do a git diff, I suggest you don't, between the code that is in the repo as of Jan 19, 2019, and the code which we will upstream now, uh, I think about 80% or 6, 70, like Somnath said, almost all of the code is rewritten. So the, it was a huge learning for us to summarize our learnings, and that's a, I, I mean, for an operator to engage at that level, uh, to me, I think the ownership lies off the code base, and path forward lies more with the operator than with us. I've always maintained writing code is simple; you can always pick lines of code. That's trivial, but making code work in production is completely different ballgame. Few things to summarize our learnings are the following: one, mixed burst packets. That's something which we didn't figure out at all. It rattled us for three whole months. We, uh, Sean Lyon is on the call. He, I mean, he'll recall. I used to go crying to him. My boss used to go crying to him. Rafal knows. Every night he used to wake me up. The code used to die. Uh, the memory leaks that Somnath touched upon, essentially, 
we basically, the way T-Mobile Poland tested was, it was a learning. The code used to work for three days. Fourth day, Rafal used to send a message, Ashok, it died. DP crashed, sec false. So the bottom line is, it helped us internalize how do you write code, especially handle mbuff somnath put a beautiful picture on it i hope you guys dig in and ask us our learnings uh, uh, so we, so that's one piece the second piece of learning was right in the beginning months two of our engagement with Timo, the way cdf from where how what exactly is separation control and data plane what are the states that need to be on the fast path engine which is the upf or data plane and what are the states that need to be on the control path that's some that was grounds of learning it meant we had to rewrite the somnath made a, a simple statement he said the state information needed to be changed but basically we needed to recode the cp okay so those are the two key learnings i think there are a few other things that we learned out of this uh, uh, over the process, in summary, to, to conclude, what we have today is we have test infrastructure at Intel. And every step, it was not one infrastructure we tested against. Uh, the Somnath put a basic Excel there. We have five different test setups. And this is thanks to the fun. Every Jira ticket, we have a test vector for. So I think that's it. I mean. Uh, it's been a huge learning. Uh, there will be some concluding remarks Sean and myself make, but thank you so much. I think that, I hope that's what you wanted me to say. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much, Ashok. This was fantastic. Awesome. So with that, uh, Ashok, you want to uh, take over and... Uh, Suresh, Suresh, why don't you start off the demo? Yeah, let me share my screen. Yes. Suresh, as you go through the demo, walk through the panels. There will be whatever panels you put up. Put up. Yeah. Orient people, don't jump into the demo, walk through, say what you're doing. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Sure, sir. Yeah. Thanks, Omlat and Ashok. Let me share my screen. Let me know once you can able to see my screen. Yes, Suresh, I can see. Yeah. Okay. And uh, this is my uh, uh, SP gateway and our C CDR dealer setup. I'm going to uh, start fresh uh, all the nodes uh, and I will explain uh, which node uh, will be starting and what is the purpose of that. So uh, probably if you have any questions or anything, put it in the Q&A uh, thing. We will uh, take it later. So I'm going to start my dealer out, so which is basically the uh, uh, connection between uh, uh, WinSCP, the SFTP clients uh, and the uh, dealer for downloading my CDR file. So I'm just uh, starting my dealer out component. I'm waiting for it to uh, finish its initialization. Yeah, so it is connected and it is I think my WinSCP uh, client is trying a reconnection. So I'm going to start my dealer in, which is uh, the interaction point between C control plane and uh, for uh, receiving the CDR records. Yeah, so it is successfully initialized. You can see it is waiting for the connection from the control plane. I'm going to start my data plane now. And I'm just configuring my S1 new SGA interfaces. Yeah, my data plane started and it is waiting, it's ready to receive connections from control plane. I'm going to start my control plane now.
so if you see here once i started the control plane it is established the connection with my dealer in so for the purpose of the demo i just added my node id as the demo so this is the control plane id for each uh, 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 control plane we have a separate id so to identify it so if you see here uh, uh, cdr record is uh, started writing so based on the uh, message cdr records from the control plane the file will be written once it reached a particular threshold then it will uh, return into a separate files so i will run a test and show you uh, uh, how the uh, data transferred and uh, how the files transferred and let's go uh, i'm using a spiren setup for just establishing with the 10 uh, user uh, connections just starting my uh, user connection let's wait for some time so to initialize the and install the control sessions and data traffic should be started then we will wait for some time and we'll stop yeah if you see here this is the active sessions in the data plane number of active sessions 10 active sessions and it is started sending uplink traffic and downlink traffic so this is the uplink uh, stats structure and downlink stats structure so number of packets received and how much is processed by my data plane and how much successfully sent it out so i can see uh, majority of the packets are processed properly and shared i think yeah we had enough data to see at least some cdr record let's go and stop the test meanwhile there are three different scenarios the cdr records are generated whatever i am showing right now is when the ue session uh, disconnected at the end we were generating the cdr there are other provisions available that is timer threshold and uh, data threshold so we can either configure the control plane to generate the cdr based on a particular timer threshold every 10 seconds or every particular time period or we can generate the record based on the data volume after a certain level of uplink data downlink data reached we can ask the, the control plane to uh, generate the cdr yeah now my connections are disconnected i can see here the data is sent to the dealer and he return into a file and once the uh, size exceeded he is returning new files L now the since the records generated let's go to the uh, winsp client let's see wh uh, whether i can uh, download this file from there yeah so i think this is the latest one generated uh, so i highlight the uh, file name usually the file names will be with a node id and whether it is a trusted node or an untrusted node and the date time format and our enclave id uh, we are using for uh, the uh, authentication and the number of sequence how many uh, record number 1 and record number 2 if you see in the highlighted one this is the first record and this is second so it will just increase in the sequential manner and this will be per node basis i am trying to download the uh, record now okay i will show in the dealer route uh, probably i will increase this one so if you see here the number of commands actually when i try to download and this is the file i send sorry this is the file i uh, sent from my uh, winsp and the number of the commands executed basically just retry and you can see this and yeah let me zoom in yeah so now the file can be accessed and uh, we can uh, parse it on the, uh, our uh, own application so and 
that's it somnath uh, do you want to explain anything else or, uh, no i think that you 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 uh, basically explained it all thanks a lot suresh yeah yeah w- one quick point i want to uh, highlight here is a very interesting point in fact rafal also uh, indicated that in a different way so if you look at the file names right uh, yeah if you look at the file names th- there's a untrusted uh, the the word untrusted you see on the file name and that basically means that uh, the control plane that has sent this data is untrusted that means the dealer couldn't verify the control plane uh, at an sgx uh, with sgx parameters that means the control plane is not running in sgx so that's something it's in the file name now interestingly you may ask oh, okay it's just a file name anybody can change the file name uh, the way the protect uh, fs of the sgx uh, system works is that this whole file name is also part of the file contents inside so if you change this file name and you want to read this file if it doesn't match then uh, the sgx uh, uh, the, the library is going to complain and say hey sorry we cannot read the file uh, for you because the file name has been tampered so there's some some nuances uh, we can uh, i mean talk about offline if you are interested i can talk about uh, more of these uh, exactly what it means to do it with this js so another a couple of questions sure taking yes okay all right uh, first question uh, what about uh, up application part of this project are you going to keep an evolved up rtc version are you willing to turn best project related to upf uh, epic project i would leave that question i, I would not answer the question because uh ashok uh, and uh, uh, uh marios from t mobile they're going to talk about the road map a little bit more uh after this uh, demo session so i will leave the question for them uh dl dff uh, equal to 9 i i see my think what you mean is uh, there is a there's some packet drops uh which you uh are indicating and those packet drops could be due to some issues in the in the network configuration uh so for now yeah there, we although we say zero packet drops but sometimes we do observe at the highest mpps rate which is 2 mpps we sometimes do observe few packets drop yeah just to add so not i think this is specific to this particular setup thing actually so yeah so sure so some of the uh, maybe due to some network uh, to, to be specific uh, the packet didn't assume the packet did not make it through the initial filter of the epc dl that's the downlink pipeline so couple of things either the packet didn't met the uip criteria and got dropped further down the pipe but that's roughly what happened or like some of the same the packet didn't get picked up fast enough which i doubt because in that case if miss packets would have shown the same number okay so the packet has been picked up from the interface the interface rings have been cleared the packet didn't make it through the filters within uh, the uh, uh, downlink pipeline itself perfect uh, another question <clears throat> uh, do you preserve cdr sequence numbers what will happen if cp crashes okay uh, good question uh, uh, yes the the sequence numbers are preserved uh, for every run of the dealer uh, in that means as long as the dealer is running uh, you'll get a monotonically increasing sequence number however if the dealer in crashes or you choose to kill it and restart the dealer in then again it will start with the new the fresh sequence number 1 for example but what happens is that it's not just the sequence number which is unique is the combination of the sequence number and the time stamp which will be unique so at any point of time if you kill the dealer you your uh, and start the dealer again you your time stamp will change so your at uh, I, i mean your combination of the time stamp and the sequence number will always be unique all right so looks like no other questions uh, so shok 
So okay. thank you, uh, Somnath. Suresh, thanks. M m maybe if I could Please, add to the CDRs, I, I can show that the code the CDR uh, in my decoder. Can, okay. Uh, Rafael, you broke up. Can you speak up again? Okay. Yeah. Uh, just to uh, add some more information about the CDRs, because there were questions about the version, uh, I can show a um, decoded one. Yes, how it looks like. Please go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, this one. So this is then an example of the uh, the code CDR. So this is a PGW record uh, with regular information that you have in your CDRs in telco environment. So there is an IMSI address uh, here. Uh, there is a charging ID, uh, serving nodes, duration, calls for closing, record symbols numbers, uh, service data, traffic volume here. So, yeah. And APN number, for example. This is some test APN. It's start time and stop time. Thanks, Rafal. Any questions? Okay. Uh, if there are no other questions, I think we go to the uh, item on our agenda, which is Open Source Plans Contribution Guidelines. Uh, Marius, can you take the floor, please, sir? Yes, sure. Give me a second to share the screen. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so that's that's very short presentation from my side. I would like just to complement what my colleague said. Uh, this is about our, I would say, major plans for the following months, and about our cooperation with uh, with Intel and with other colleagues from from OMEC. So my name is Marcz Kowalski. Uh, I'm working for Deutsche Telekom Shared Service Center Group. Um, oops, okay, let's go to the next one. And basically, I'm working with uh, in this telco industry for 20 years already, and uh, from different places in the company, from operations to development, and right now in the in international units. And uh, the most important thing here in all this exercise is the team. I would say, so especially uh, Rafa and uh, Darek, who was also in our team, but uh, unfortunately he moved to to different department. Uh, but I would like to say that that wouldn't be possible with, without this team. So that's very important for me. This slide you already saw. This is uh, from Rafa. I just wanted to connect this Rafa slide to to the next one that I have. Uh, this is the real implementation of the open gateway or the plant implementation of the open source gateway for our T-Mobile Poland uh, implementation in one of the places. Uh, Rafa already mentioned that we are using or we are going to use the, the commercial network with that and basically the commercial elements like uh, MME and HSS. And uh, this open source gateway will be uh, placed in the customer premises, let's say, and will be used for data processing there. Yeah, so basically, uh, we, I would say the implementation of, of such scenario of the campus networks is much easier comparing to 
uh, to different scenarios where the MME and also HSS is placed at the customer premises. Uh, of course, we have additional issues then with, uh, with some security stuff. But basically, the integration effort is much, much uh, smaller, I would say. And I think also the, the cost of the solution is, is, uh, is much, much more effective. Okay, so this is the, the example of this Campus Networks uh, implementation in Mobile Poland. And I would like just to mention that uh, T-Mobile Poland is just one example of that uh, because we already started uh, with some showcases for some other NATCOs. And uh, we also offered this solution for the implementation uh, all over the Europe. And we already have such interest there and we already have the plans to, to do imp implementation. Of course, right now at the moment, this is, this is only the mm, showcasing, I would say, but basically uh, many operators in our group are interested in this scenario. As we all know that uh, probably not every customer, not every business customer, uh, will be interested in implementation of the campus networks installation uh, because that might be too expensive for, for this customer. So basically that uh, open source gateway uh, used for the campus network implementation is one of the possible options, which I believe is, is a very good, good option because uh, we don't need too much, let's say, EPC specific features uh, for this campus network scenario. So that's just the information from my side about this uh, possible implementation. And there is one, I would say, statement probably that uh, we as a shared service center right now, we are responsible for various, I would say, software testing for a few vendors. And we as a shared service center are also the certification center, kind of certification center uh, for DT uh, NATCOS. So we usually take the, the, the software from the vendor and then we implement this software uh, across our NATCOS after the certification in our unit. So from, from our point of view, it's quite, I would say, easy to add one more uh, EPC, uh, let's say vendor here, but I'm talking about this open source gateway solution uh, to our por portfolio of, of, of testing. And basically our test automation framework is uh, able to test either using the, the simulators or even the, the real te terminals, uh, the new released software that will be published in the in the either in the uh, private repo or the community uh, so basically that's the that's the statement from from our side as i mentioned this presentation is uh, is short as i think rafael uh, on monday covered majority of the things so basically that's it from my side the only Thank you if we have any questions here. I think. No, Maria, there are okay, no Okay, there is still the, the only the outstanding question from Grzegorz uh, from the last part. So Do you want to take that or shall I take that, Maria? I think you should take that. Yeah, why don't I take that after I finish a couple okay. of, one slide that I want to show. Uh, point. And then take this question up. Okay, I would sure. also like to bring in play our investments. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thank uh, you. Thank you. Thanks, Marius. Thank you very much. I'll take the floor here. Okay, 
I have a single slide here. I'm not sure which one you guys are seeing. Are you, okay, hang on. Are you guys seeing my screen? I'm intending to present a slide. Yeah, I think you can see it. So. Perfect. Thanks, Dinesh. Okay. It's a single slide. Uh, where we are today, we are basically at the bottom left of this slide. What we have going is what uh, Mihal Severa and Raf Rafal alluded to as the minimum viable product, MVP. This is where we are. Excuse me, Ashok, we're seeing the agenda on the screen. I think you want to show oh, the slide. Okay, hang on, thank you, sorry. Give me a second, thanks. Are you seeing the slide now, Sean? We uh, are, it looks great. Perfect, okay, so yeah, I won't put it in slide mode, that's fine. So basically where we are today is at the bottom left of the screen where Mihal and Rafal, which T-Mobile Poland refers to as MVP. Uh, the path forward is, so, so before I, so the pictures explains the path forward. There are some rough timelines that are up here. Uh, uh, not to say that these are watertight, which means that uh, Dinesh Kumar, who's my colleague in the Ethernet Platforms group uh, at Intel, uh, we are doing some work forwards. But the point is, uh, so there is, this is a rough uh, delivery timeline that we have. The code base that would land on OMEC is this MVP code base. Uh, as we go forward, uh, like Marius explained, there are different scenarios that we will work together with T-Mobile Poland to make sure that each step on this slide achieves what we would call as viable production base. Uh, I'm going to stop here. So what, what, what does this do for us? Let's dig a little deeper and I'll take up that question that was posted. I'll also want to speak a little bit about, uh, Marius touched upon T-Mobile Poland's investment. I would also like to speak about what our investments would be, and what our interests are. So step two of this graph basically says, okay, you can see a bunch of different technologies other than DPDK. The point here is we have some learnings, we have some technologies at Intel. Our real interest with T-Mobile Poland was they taught us. Uh, so far, our learning, Intel's learning as a silicon chip manufacturer comes from our customers. Customers teach us. T-Mobile Poland taught us. What do customers teach us? They teach us their problems. T-Mobile Poland taught for the first time, in my mind, they taught Intel, what does it take to get packet processing in an oper operational infrastructure right? That's what they taught us. Once they taught us that, we realized that every technology has its purpose. Every technology, sorry, TPDK. There's a whole bunch of technologies we have within the Ethernet platforms group. It has its place in, it, it has its place or we have to be bold enough to accept the technology is misplaced for the industry. So our biggest get is the learning in right positioning our technologies and investments into these technologies. So step two would be, we would basically have uh, multiple technologies on the same code base. So essentially the NGIC piece would more or less be same. It would e evolve at the application layer with different scenarios that I'm hoping it's not just T-Mobile Poland beyond this. 
it would be other operators in the OMEC community that support us, that pick this up and take it uh, for test drives and actual deployments. But the point is, it would also give us the ability to see what technologies really solve problems in the infrastructure. That's where we'll go with this. And then the last piece is, once we have different networking technologies in place, we would basically drive scale with different infrastructure technologies. That's what our roadmap is. In terms of investments, uh, our interest, Intel's interest essentially has been, uh, this is the fact that this work is supported by a business group at Intel, means we see commercial value for us in it. The commercial value can be twofold. It can either be we sell, or we learn to invest in technologies. For us, it's the latter, we learn. And that's the biggest return for our investment as EPG. Once we learn, we know where to place and position our technologies. And that's the starting point for my colleagues, Todd and Sean on this call here. Uh, I'm going to stop. Uh, I think that's about it. Uh, in terms of what we will do, we will, what Marius has, sorry, uh, I, I missed a point. Marius basically pointed out that uh, the shared services center would serve as a testing ground. They have done us huge by serving as just that, by making us realize what is a commercially viable product today. What EPG plans to do, what we would drive Dinesh, myself, Somnath, we would drive us through EPG is have, hopefully if it pans out within OMEC, we, like Sean said, this code base starts to have the ramifications of Linux. It can be open sourced, but it can still be commercial. There's a difference. All op open source work doesn't necessarily need to be research open source work like Linux can be for product grade deployments. And Dinesh and I work for the open, Linux open source driver development team. Our core job is to feed the Linux open source community and we consider OMEC as an extension of that. So our investments would be, we would build with the mobile Poland support and we invite other operators in the OMEC community to help us. We would build shared labs, which would be accessible by the OMEC community so that we all can grow this code base as a commercial product offering. Same lines as Linux. I think that's all I have to say. I know there's one question. Let me pick up that question. Hang on. Okay, so the question is, can you explain the question, Gregorius? You say, what about you user plane application part of this project? Are you going to keep an evolved UPRTC version or are you willing to turn towards BES? So I understand when you, when you say, what about UP part of this project? And when you say UPRTC version, can you elaborate please, sir? Okay, I think I think I need to enable you to speak. Hang on a second. Yeah, oh, guys, go ahead. Okay, frankly speaking, um, on your repository, there is a two, two project. Uh, we're talking about the run to complete project, which you were talking about. From the second hand, there is a project, which is, um, I, I put the name, it's a, it's a UP, UPF uh, EPC, which is the, uh, the best project wrapper on the top of the best, best project. So, so the question is, how are you going to evolve the, 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 this project? Are we going to evolve toward the run to, complete, run to completion? Uh, the way how you, how you handle the packets or we would like to completely change the, the skin and would like you complete, complete change the, the way how you handle the, 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 the user packets? Uh, 
I will explain from a technology perspective, not from the code bases that sit in OMEC. I'll leave that for OWS and the TST to respond as to how the code bases would be handled. But uh, I'll leave that to OWS. But in terms of technology itself, uh, the driving function here is the current code base, T-Mobile Poland, is not yet on at OMEC. The design of the current code base is run to complete. So we have one code in either direction that processes packets to completion. Now in terms of, so that's the te technical answer. Now in terms of throwing different technologies at an application, at a packet processing application code base, well, the uh, the, the different technologies would need to make sense as to what is the problem they are solving versus what's the great thing that the technology does. So uh, I wouldn't know I wouldn't know answers to the question I just asked. So if I say best, I don't know what problem best solves in an operational network. Why would it cut? Uh, why would it uh, make a cut? What kind of problems? I do not know. That's the process we are in, in terms of scale, et cetera. Hopefully we'll figure it out. I don't know. But in terms of code basis of August, can you take up that question, please, sir? August? Okay, I guess uh, I was just muted, but that's fine. So uh, the question that's as far as I can answer. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, with that, I think we are at the end. Uh, Marius, Rafal, Mihal, Severin. I Marcus. think that there are three more questions. About Sorry. the delivery, yeah. de delivery software to community. To definitely, it, it was the our vision. It this software that we developed with, together with Intel will not be our private software. It will be published. Uh, I believe it will be soon. I mean weeks, not months. Uh, uh, and yes, so. Whole whole idea of open community is that each operator, each uh, developer, uh, contribute to the project and gives back. Yeah. Thank you, Rafal. I will put a date on it, a week on it to be specific. We are hoping. Uh, 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 so a couple of things need to happen here. Uh, we are hoping that the TST going forward would would drive and hold firm. Uh, put in place some contribution guidelines. Uh, so our target to bring the code back to OMEC is week of April 13th. That's when the code will hit, but it would be conditioned on the following. Uh, we definitely need clearly agreed on contribution guidelines at the TST. Uh, we definitely would not be able to entertain pull requests on this code base. Uh, there has to be a process. It should be operator driven. So any contribution should be validated by an operator. At this point, it is T-Mobile Poland. We are hoping, uh, I mean, that's a huge responsibility and burden for T-Mobile Poland by themselves to handle. We are hoping that the community of operators grows to entertain contributions. So the bottom line is, A, we need to have contribution guidelines firmed up at the TST. Our goal here is to make sure that the MVP does not get diluted with excellent, contributions could be excellent, but we need to make sure the MVP continues to stay commercially viable. Uh, we need to be really watchful about the regression cycles that it can spin. So uh, to the uh, question, when would this code hit? Target week is April 13. Why April 13? There's a few other things that we need to clean up. Things need to look, be back, that's when the code will hit, but it will be conditioned on when the TSD 
comes up with a very clear set of contribution guidelines. And for sure, pull requests would not be a mechanism to go forward with this code. Thank you. Uh, Ajay, you have a question here. Validation by T-Mobile Poland. Let me enable you, Ajay, so you can speak up. Hang on a second. You have to ask the most questions. One second. Okay, yeah. Ajay, you can speak. Yeah. Yeah. My my question was like, uh, is it uh, really feasible to validate each and every feature or each and every pull request uh, by operator? Because their pull requests are typically of two type, right? One is just bug fix under certain conditions, which sometimes may not be really reproducible in the operator environment, and second, it's feature based pull request. So. Fantastic question, which is why I initially said we wouldn't be able to entertain pull requests to begin. Maybe with I will answer as well. Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you. Okay, so uh, you know this software will run in our commercial network. We as operator, uh, are, we are afraid that if everyone will code uh, anything in that and it will be not tested and later we would like to add our features. This untested features could, you know, affect our commercial deployment if we upgrade. So if if there are bug fixes, there is no problem to, to test uh, for us and uh, it doesn't matter. I think it will be not slowing down, but it will help you to you know to, to check if this bug fixes is working. In terms of the new features, I believe that if this new feature is suitable for T-Mobile Poland, we will test it, of course. Uh, if this feature, I believe this feature is written for some operator or some uh, company, right? So this company is uh, uh, should test it by, by itself, right? We can grab the software and uh, run our regular tests if something is broken, but if uh, this new feature is uh, it's not suitable for our, for example, network environment, so we will, we will not be able even to test it, right? So I think that uh, each operator or each uh, consumer of the software should also test it, right? Really well stated, Rafal. So uh, uh, Ajay, get back to you. The point that's the reason I said all contributors should bring in ratifications of features, uh, feature contributions with an operator support because then we are actually looking at the end user or customer here is the operator. If the operator says yes, this feature is valid, then the operator also needs to invest in the feature to essentially test, pull the OMEC, the code base that we will open source, pull it down, run a test, add the feature, make sure the test doesn't break anything, and then bring it back as a contribution to grow the code base. That's how our Linux drivers grows. We hit networking devices, and every feature that we add, whether it's Mellanox or Intel, we grow. Dinesh may be able to add a few sentences on this, but we grow commercially, and that's what we're hoping Omai could help us do. So, Ajay, back to your statement. Rafal hit it. If you're adding a feature, please bring it in, bring that feature in with an operator who signs off on that feature. Got it, yeah. So once again, uh, uh, to the OMEC TST committee, we wouldn't be able to entertain pull requests. The key here is the process has to be bring in a feature with an operator and absolutely, that's where we need to bring in investments. Yeah, Ashok, uh, I also looked at this uh, code uh, which is uh, on the website now and I see some of the features that we are interested like uh, uh, static IP uh, APN. I believe that some work is done. SGX is some work is done. I think those features are very interested for us and we should think about how to merge master branch and our branch, right? It's, merge it's very hard. Yeah, very, merge, it would be merge, very hard. 
merge will be tough, but we can definitely absorb features from the main branch. Uh, we can bring in the contributors. We can definitely look at that. Yeah. Okay. There are any other questions? Uh, Ajay, you asked about validation by T-Mobile Poland. Is this question at rest? So, Ajay? Yeah, it's addressed, but, uh, but I have a lot of questions, but probably this is not right forum. But I understood like each thing should be validated by some operators. Yeah. So, so towards that also, Ajay, as I said, EPG, we would be making an investment. If the community, there's a full demand from the OMEC community in accessing, uh, essentially this code base, as I said, we have five different test setups, uh, which basically replicate what T-Mobile Poland does in an operational network. If the community is interested in accessing, so let's say uh, the community members take this code base, they add a feature, they want to see if it's broken, uh, they don't have a test infrastructure, we as EPG are happy to make these test infrastructures available, but that's something we need to take at the TST and discuss. Yeah, okay, thanks. With that, I think we are at the end. Uh, 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 Todd, Sean, uh, Marius, any closing comments? Uh, this is Sean. I would just say that uh, the, the community bears responsibility for the success or failure of, of these products. Uh, and the community is ultimately um, the owners of these products, right? So the more important aspect of what we're doing here is developing this community to be successful. Everybody has a, a role in that and everybody has a role to play in the development of the community ongoing. And we look forward to supporting your success. And this is Todd Kelling with Intel. I'm the communications segment marketing manager in our connectivity group. And first of all, I'd just like to say thank you to all the presenters on behalf of the audience. This has been very informative uh, information from different angles and good detail. We really appreciate that. And, and likewise, echo what Sean said and just thank all the attendees in the audience. It really does take a community to make this happen. And, and that's part of why I'm here today is to help scale this out to additional technologies and players to make this happen. I think we're onto something good here and look forward to seeing how it can grow. Marius, Rafal, any closing comments? Sir? I don't see Michal. Yeah, maybe I would just uh, uh, would like to publicly thank you, Ashok, for, for all the effort and uh, the year of the uh, collaboration. I believe uh, you said that uh, we taught you something. I think we also learned uh, a lot of uh, information. How, how does the code is built? What are the problems with the coding, right? So we weren't aware as an operator uh, what the problems could look like. Yeah. I think this, a... this cooperation was very unique, I would say, right now, yeah? Guys, thank you so much. So uh, Ashok, okay. uh, any Ashok, closing comments here? Yeah, there's, but, uh, sorry, there's one question, one unanswered question from Gregors. I think he's uh, looking for an answer. I think it's on the AFXDP. Yes, ah, sorry. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, are you thinking the AP, QE2020? Okay. Uh, answer is yes. Q2, Q3. Oh, this or is the question a, about the... Or based, so it's about, are you thinking about Q2 2020 about Linux native EPBF, FXDP based UP application or uh, no. So Gregor's, we are looking at AFXDP. First is the following steps. Let me elaborate. We are looking at the same packet processing application run just out of Linux. We already have it running in a private repo, satisfying all the test vectors. None of the Linux steroids, ADQ, FXTP, none of it. Uh, at this point, it's runtime switchable as well. The next step would be to bring in ADQ and flow redirectors, to essentially redirect fast and slow path path traffic. The next step would be Linux MMAP. The next step would be FXTP with without ADQ. And then we would sit back and compare how these different technologies pan out, what are the performance vectors, and where do they really, what, what technology, once you have a spread of 
different networking technologies underlying the UPF itself, we will be in a good position to figure out which networking technology for what kind of infrastructure. Uh, and yes, the timeline is Q2 2020. Sean Lyon and Todd Colling, who are on the call, have my neck for it. Does it answer your question, Vibos? I think that's it. Rafal, anything else? Huh? So I'm not okay. any closing comments? Yeah, sorry. No, that's fantastic. Uh, just hopefully we can catch up on some sleep this year. <laughs> Last year we could. Uh, there were a lot of sleepless nights, but no, but the uh, end result is just beautiful. So. In closing, I, I, there has been a lot of interest with containers. I specifically have Dinesh join this call. There's a lot of interest with containers, how does code scale, et cetera. So Dinesh is working on containerizing this minimum viable product. Uh, Dinesh can speak up, but uh, we should have some time on it very soon. Dinesh. Yeah, so I think as uh, Asok has presented in the roadmap, so we have uh, start looking and, you know, scaling it out in the cloud, specifically in the container. So we're looking in the Kubernetes uh, as an open source project and managing all these uh, VNFs that comes in part of OMAC. So hopefully, you know, Q2, Q3 timeframe will have uh, um, this, this all available um, and be able to use that as part of container and Kubernetes environments. Thanks, Dinesh. That's all. Uh, Denise, back to you. Thanks. I think we're done. All right. Thank you very much for joining us today. We appreciate your taking the time. We will be making available the recordings from both part one and part two of this workshop um, on YouTube shortly. A link will be sent to all of the registered participants of this webinar. We'll also be making available the slides. Thank you again for joining us. Have a good day. Thanks, guys. Bye -bye. Thank you very much.